and welcome everybody, um, colleagues, co-romanticists, friends, even family. Uh, lovely to see so many uh, colleagues and friends here this evening. Uh, I hope you're all keeping well in these in these tricky times, and I hope you're well. I'm thoroughly fed up with with, with lockdown, but I, I guess everyone is. Um, thanks, Greg, for that introduction. Um, I was I think I, I may have mentioned to you in an email. I was teaching in my course on Romanticism and the French Revolution. I was um, teaching from your book on your wonderful book on Rousseau and Robespierre and the and the and, and British Romanticism just just last week and. Uh, it's it's that's that's the kind of nice circularity of teaching that you you start to, your own PhD students become part of your pedagogic project. So thank you for that. Okay, um, I'm going to now, without further ado, um, share screen. Um, I hope. Hang on. Okay. So, very romantic among these mountains and lakes, John Keats and the Highland Tour. In a letter to Benjamin Bailey of July 18, 1818, Keats described his primary motive for touring Scotland as being to further his development as a poet. I thought it would give me more experience, rub off more prejudice, use me to more hardship, identify finer scenes, load me with grander mountains and strengthen more my reach in poetry than would stopping at home among books, even though I should reach Homer. By contrast, his retrospective remark in a letter to Mrs. Wiley of 6th August hints that the tour had been a more lighthearted affair. I have been wary romantic among these mountains and lakes. The soft V in wary here suggests that Keats is playing with a touch of Cockney carnivalesque, which I'll argue in this talk permeates both the practice of a tour as well as his letters home. A notorious uh, Z reviews um, in Blackwood's magazine in 1817 had lambasted Keats and Lee Hunt's poetic circle for their suburban London pastoral. Mr. Hunt is altogether unacquainted with the face of nature in her magnificent scenery. He has never seen any mountain higher than Highgate Hill, nor reclined by any stream more pastoral than the Serpentine River. Robin Jarvis argues that Keats, playing to the stereotype, self-consciously dialogized the contrasting idioms and styles that distinguish the polite language of Georgian tour writing, and this is what he calls the spoken jargon of Cockneys. Geoffrey Robinson, who's I'm delighted to see in the audience tonight, evoking Pierre Jory's nomadic poetics, discovers a similar quality in his tour poetry. I quote, the foreignness and the extent of the trip also led Keats away from the homes of traditional verse to experiments in writing, both the prose of his letters and the unpredictable experimental poems. By exploring Keats's Cockneyism in relation to contemporary debates about the Scottish tour, this talk will consider Keats's tour and its verbal record as a distinctive cultural performance, not just a key episode in his creative development. As I've argued in uh, Stepping Westward, actually, this isn't really a byproduct, it's a kind of, um, it's a little inset bit of, uh, Stepping Westward has been extended um, in, this, in this talk, which is based on a paper commissioned by Nick Rowe for a, a conference on Keats in Scotland. That was a wonderful conference held in St Andrews, um, I think a couple of years ago. But as I argued in Stepping Westward, by 1818, the Scottish tour and tour narratives inaugurated by Thomas Pennant and Dr Johnson in the 1770s had become something of cultural and literary, literary cliché. In a devastating 1809 quarterly review essay on Sir John Carr's Caledonian sketches, Walter Scott proclaimed, it would perhaps be somewhat difficult to bring us news from Scotland for tender youth, uh, uh, sorry, for, tend for uh, tender youth and weary age, the information which they seek in person may be found in a hundred volumes. There is Johnson's philosophic tour, Pennant's descriptive tour, Gilpin's picturesque tour, Stoddart's sketching tour, Newt's nautical tour, Mormon's bookselling tour, Campbell's crazy tour, Lithia's insipid tour with the humours of the bear and monkey. The curious may learn without stirring from the sound of Bow Bell, the depth of the supposed unfathomable Loch Ness, the four wonders of Loch Lomond, the height of Fingal's Cave, and all those Caledonian memorabilia, which the more desperate visit in person at the expense of being obliged to drink whiskey and eat scatan agus bratan agus puntata, uh, uh, which means um, uh, herring and uh, salmon and potatoes. Scott was, meanwhile, um, 
inventing the conditions for the next uh, wave of um, Scottish tourism based on the massive success of his Lady of the Lake, 1810, Waverley, 1814, and Rob Roy, 1817. Anne Rigney and Nicola Watson have explored Scott's massive commercial success in keeping pace with the development of the very tourist sensibility that his romances had instigated, mediating poems and novels through pocket editions, maps, topographical engravings, not to mention their popular adaptation for theatre, opera, and pantomime. Not everyone was impressed, however. Writing to Wordsworth in October 1810, Coleridge complained of the Lady of the Lake that, a man accustomed to cast words in metre and familiar with descriptive poets and tourists, himself a picturesque tourist, must be troubled with a mental strangury if he could not lift up his leg six times at six different corners and each time piss a canto. In his book, um, The Highlands and Western Islands and Letters Addressed to Sir Walter Scott, 1824, the egregious Celtophobe and geologist John McCulloch lamented the effect of Scott's romances in commodifying the Highlands. The mystic portal of the Highlands has been thrown open and the mob has rushed in, dispersing all these fairy visions and polluting everything with its unhallowed touch. Barouches and gigs, cockneys and fishermen poets, Glasgow weavers and traveling haberdashers now swarm in every resting place and meet us at every avenue. The circle of pollution is spreading fast to the far north and the remoter west. Every Cockney who goes from Cheapside to Staffer expects to find it built on the model of Bow Church. McCulloch's tirade here picks up the tone of the Blackwoods articles on the Cockneys, especially Zed's opening attack on, um, uh, on Hunt, uh, quoted above. But even the most pre prejudiced Cockney tourists were unlikely to match McCulloch's uh, racist personification of the figure he called Donald the Gale as he fulsomely praised the notorious clearances wrought by the Marchioness of Stafford on her extensive Sutherland estates. In the summer of 1818, exactly, co exactly coinciding with Keats's tour, Stafford's agents being, began the extensive clearance known to Gales as Bliadna Nanloska, the year of the burnings, quote, possibly the largest single coerced relocation of rural populations achieved in modern British history to that time, the judgment of uh, Eric Richards, the historian of the clearances. I'll return later in this talk to the importance of Scott's fairy ground for romance and poetry, as he called it, as a context for post-1815 Highland tourism and Keats's idiosyncratic response to it. When the 22-year-old Keats and his 31-year-old friend, Charles Armitage Brown, London businessman, merchant, and amateur playwright, set off on their walking tour from Lancaster on June the 25th, 1818, they intended to make a four month excursion through the English lakes in Scotland. After a detour to Northern Ireland to visit the Giant's Causeway, they would head north on the well-beaten Highland Long Tour with a view to walking as far north as John O'Groats on the Pentland Firth. In the event, Keats developed an ulcerated throat during the exhausting trek across Mull uh, between July the 22nd and 24th. And by August the 6th, an Inverness doctor recommended he take a boat back to London, which he did on August the 8th, boarding the George at Cromarty. In the sense, Keats's truncated Scottish tour, like the long poem Endymion that he'd completed the previous November, was, quote, a feverish attempt rather than a deed accomplished. Yet although the duration of Keats's tour was shortened to less than a month and a half, he still estimated that he and Brown had walked 600 miles as well as riding another 400. And you can see the, the, the route um, on this map here from Carol Kairos's uh, wonderful Walking North with Keats, which is really a must for anyone interested in Keats' tour, and I'll say more about the new edition of that book at the, at the end of my talk. Writing to Fanny Keats from Dumfries, Keats underlined the strenuous task the pair set for themselves, especially as their tight financial straits necessitated budget travel. We're generally up at about five, walking before breakfast, and we complete uh, 20 miles before dinner. After Keats's return to London, Brown continued on his own, probably going as far as John O'Groats, and returned to Edinburgh around September the 1st. After visiting Benjamin Bailey at Carlisle, he returned to London at the end of the same month, or early October. This only whetted his appetite for more. Brown's article on the state of religion in the Highlands, published in the New Monthly Magazine in 1822, proves that he made another far more extensive Highland tour between early May and 16th September 1820. Brown attended an outdoor communion service at Loch Inver on the remote northwest coast of Sutherland, describing the moving spectacle of over 3,000 celebrants singing Gaelic psalms before their mountainous backdrop. 
Disconcertingly for Keatsins, in another essay on mountain scenery published that same year, Brown commented on this solo tour, quote, in the Highlands, a traveler is the worse for a companion. He wants to commune with none but his own soul. The awful wonders occupy his mind to fullness. His thoughts are solemn and must not be distracted. Robin Jarvis describes the romantic pedestrian tour as a new form of masculine middle-class self-fashioning. Although by 1818, by no means an unusual practice, romantic pedestrians eschewed the comforts of the commodified tourist infrastructure mocked by McCulloch, at the same time as self-consciously embracing the role of romantic wanderers. Keats's mask, uh, Keats's Cockney mask slips um, at Lake Windermere uh, when he regretted its disfigurement, as he put it, by, quote, the miasma of London, contaminated with bucks and soldiers and women of fashion and hat-band ignorance. At Loch Lomond, similarly, he grumbled to Tom that steamboats on Loch Lomond and barouches on its sides take a little from the pleasure of such romantic trap chaps as Brown and I. By 1818, tourists greatly benefited from the improvements to Scotland's transport infrastructure, inaugurated by the 1803 Commission for Roads and Bridges, supervised by the indefatigable Thomas Telford, rendering popular inland sites like the Trossachs more accessible for tourists in chases and on horseback. Steam packets had recently begun to ply the locks and firths of the west coast, and new canals had increased the speed and ease of travel, like Telford's mighty Caledonian Canal, which Keats and Brown saw being excavated as they tramped, tramped up the Great Glen from Fort William to Inverness in the first week of August. Slow travellers on a tight budget, they avoided these costly new options. Although hiring guides to accompany them up Skiddaw and Ben Nevis and across Mull to Iona, they deliberately avoided climbing Ben Lomond because the guide was too expensive. And for the same reason, avoided climbing. Uh, sorry, for the same reason, abandoned their plan to take a boat. Uh, take a boat to Stafford, because the going price price was an astronomical seven guineas. Keats complained, "Just like paying sixpence for an apple at the playhouse." Pedestrians enabled them to stray off. The, pedestrianism enabled them to stray off the beaten track, and as we'll see, they were able to pursue their cheap journey to Iona and perhaps Stafford by hiking across Mull and chartering a boat at Bonesson or Finnafort. Robin Jarvis also underlines the um, um, element of what he calls the element of deliberate social nonconformism of opposit oppositionality in the self leveling expeditions of most early pedestrians. Numerous men and a few intrepid women made Scottish walking tours in the years between 1800 and 1820, though few of these social explorers actually published accounts of their tours. The radical Rousseauian values associated with the founding text of the genre. John Thelwell's Peripatetic of 1793, informed the writings of many subsequent tourists, including John Bristed's pedestrian tour through part of the Highlands of Scotland, published in 1803. And here you can see the frontispiece of Bristed's book. We were neither artists nor connoisseurs, Bristed insisted, but rather, if I may say so, two philosophical vagabonds who wished to examine the condition of the great mass of the people. Bristed here echoes Thelwell's little party of vagrant philosophers, for him, quote, information and improvement were to constitute the principal features of our expedition. Perhaps for this reason, disguise was central to the cultural practice of pedestrianism. As Coleridge's fellow traveler, Joseph Hux wrote in his pedestrian tour through North Wales in 1794, I much doubt whether you would recognize us through our disguise. We carry our clothes, etc., in a wallet or knapsack. All ideas of appearance and gentility they're entirely out of the question. Our object is to see, not to be seen. But the cloak of social invisibility sometimes assumed a more conspicuous form. When Bristed, uh, who was an English medical student at Edinburgh University, and his Irish friend, Andrew Cowan, performed their two-week circuit of the Scottish Petit Tour in 1801, they disguised themselves as American sailors because they believed, wrongly as it turned out, that labouring class Scots would be less prejudiced against Americans than against English or Irishmen. This helps make sense of the social motives for Keats and Brown's pedestrian tour. Even if their extraordinary, even theatrical traveling costumes were hardly the garb of po poverty. Keats wore a fur cap, presumably a bit like the one in the picture of Bristed that we've just seen, with a great plaid and knapsack, while Brown sported an even more conspicuous outfit. As he wrote to Dilk on 7th August 1818, imagine me with a thick stick in my hand, the knapsack at my back, with spectacles on nose, a white hat, a tartan coat and trousers, 
and a highland plaid thrown over my shoulder. Don't laugh at me, there's a good fellow. This extravaganza he tried to justify on functional grounds. The best possible dress, as Dr. Pangloss would say, it is light and not easily penetrated by the wet, and when it is, it's not cold. There's little more than a kind of heavy, smoky sensation about it. Rather than being a um, cultural camouflage, though, Brown's uh, choice of an ostentatious tartan outfit reflects his pride, mentioned um, by Keats, in the fact that his grandfather came from Long Island, probably the island of Ling on the Argyle coast. Brown wrote that Keats dubbed him the Red Cross Knight and declares my own shadow is ready to split its sides as it follows me. I'd suggest that the Spencerian allusion here is a reference to the broad red crosses checkering the clan brown tartan, uh, doubtless purchased uh, by a Charles in a fashionable tartan outfitter in London. Pedestrian disguise carried its own risks. Bristed and Cowan, traveling during, the, during wartime at the height of invasion scare, were mistaken for French spies, English deserters, Irish rebels, uh, or wandering Jews. Two decades later in peacetime, but in another era of radical unrest leading up to the Peterloo and Scotland's radical insurrection of 1820, Keats recorded that he and Brown had been taken for, I quote, spectacle vendors, razor sellers, jewelers, traveling linen drapers, spies, excise man, and many things else I have no idea of. They entered Glasgow on July the 14th, quote, under the most oppressive stare a body could feel. Keats was accosted by a drunk, never happens usually in Glasgow, who threateningly, threateningly informed him that, quote, he has seen all foreigners, but he's never saw the likes of me. I was obliged to mention the word officer and police before he would desist. That at least suggested that their disguise had been effective. But much more embarrassing was Brown's fear that they'd been smoked when, as they set out from Lancaster, um, on the first morning of the tour, a labourer sarcastically observes to his companion, there go a couple of gentlemen, having nothing to do, they are finding out hard work for themselves. Brown sententiously commented, our fellow laborer was in the right. We all work for the means of enjoying life, some way, one way, some another, some for excitement, some for the pleasure of excitement, some for health. Although Keats's social status as a, a gentleman was rather questionable in the summer of 1818, pedestrians took pains to disguise social rank, further supported by these tourists Steamy's refusal to take sugar with their meals and their generally frugal economy. They seem to have made that pledge before they set out from Lancaster. Encounters with other disguised pedestrians caused some mild friction. At the inn at Ambleside on Friday, June 26th, Brown recorded meeting one such who perversely hinted to them that he was, quote, to be regarded as an important gentleman in disguise. Dropping hints about his Oxford education, Almax and the opera, he nevertheless, quote, invade against the silly pride of rank and birth, informing me that his lamented father was unhappily gifted with that failing, namely, a genealogy traced from Edward I. But at the same time, he thought nothing whatever of it. Dismissing his pretenses to be a radical, Brown concluded that he was a London sharper, while, quote, Keats walked off the moment he exposed his folly, and afterwards I became savage with myself for not having been savage towards him. The class politics of this encounter are fascinating, exposing pedestrian tourism as a kind of radical chic. One might speculate that the pedestrian tourist concerned with social disguise had a bearing on Keats's reflection, expressed in a famous letter to Woodhouse on October 27, 1818, about the poetical character. It has no character. It enjoys light and shade. It lives in gusto, be it foul or fair, high or low, rich or poor, mean or elevated. A year after his northern tour, Keats wrote, I may call myself an old stager in the picturesque in a jokey 1819 letter to Charles Dilk from the Isle of Wight. But like the Wordsworths 15 years before him in Scotland, Keats actually rejected the jargon of a picturesque tour in the tradition of Gilpin et al, preferring what Charles Brown described as a superficial view of nature. Mine is literally a superficial view of nature, Brown wrote, which is one recommendation at least, everybody can understand it. In Keats's case, this was expressed in an experimental and phenomenological prose and poetry. For example, describing his first view of Lakeland Mountains and Waterfalls, he wrote, I never forget my stature so completely. I live in the eye and my imagination, surpassed is at rest. Unlike the Wordsworths, though, Keats absorbed the old stage's parody into his tour writing. As a, so there's a salient difference between his nuanced descriptions, quote, the tone, the colouring, 
the slate, the stone, the moss, the rockweed, or if I may say the intellect of the waterfall at Ambleside. And his satire and picturesque cliche in his letter to Reynolds of July the 13th from Ayrshire. I'll not run over the ground we've passed. That would be merely a, as bad as telling a dream. Unless perhaps I do it in the manner of the Laputan printing press. That I put down mountain, rivers, lakes, dells, glens, rocks and clouds with beautiful, enchanting, gothic, picturesque, fine, delightful, enchanting, grand, sublime, a few blisters, etc. And now you have our journey thus far. Keats joked about um, out Radcliffing and Radcliffe, the Gothic novelist in this respect, but he might also have had his sights on Sarah Murray of Kensington's best-selling book, Companion and Useful Guide to Scotland. Murray's breathless hyperbolic style was the perfect target for Keats's Laputin parody. The Reeky Lynn is the finest fall I saw in Scotland, except the fall of Foyers. At least until the falls of Arry, where she explained, exclaims, I never saw a more picturesque fall, and in the Great Clan, I was on the whole way in constant exclamation. Here is another. Oh, how fine, how beautiful, how dashing. For all that, I, I'm a huge fan of um, Sarah Murray's Companion and Useful Guide and would recommend it to anyone who hasn't read it. Reading published guides and keeping travel journeys, journals were both essential elements of the late Georgian tour. And as, in this respect, Keats and Brown were no exception. A distinctive feature of Keats's tour narrative, however, is the fact that it's entirely composed of letters um, drafted after a long day's walking, addressed to his invalid brother, Tom, and his sister Fanny in London, to the recent emigrants, George and Georgina Keats in America, and to friends like Reynolds and Bailey. Posted en route, these episodic letters represent a form of writing to the moment, quite different from the standard travel account of a period. Based on field notes, but written up at home with the advantage of access to prior travelogues and other reference books. John Barnard notes that in Keats's familial correspondence, he, quote, found a space in which to relax, experiment, entertain, memorialize, speculate, pun, and joke, and do so in what is very close to a speaking voice. And here's a, um, a rather poor, I'm afraid, um, photograph of a page from um, Keats's letter to Tom um, of July the 17th, which, which shows a little sketch of Loch Lomond, um, the, 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 the view up Loch Lomond from, from um, I guess, from Lass or somewhere. Uh, and there are a few of those sketches in his letters. Even the act of entertaining friends and family at a distance was time consuming. Keats complained in his 28th June letter to George and Georgi Georgiana that I have a journal to keep up for Tom, nearly enough to employ all my leisure. I'm a day behind with him. I scarcely know how I will manage Fanny and two or three others I have promised. Another contemporary Highland tourist, the Wrexham banker John Bowman, complained in 1825 that writing his journal was, quote, excessively laborious after the unremitting exertions of the day and it required a considerable resolution to persevere. But we were aware that if we relaxed, but for a single day, the constant succession of new objects would render it difficult, if not impossible, to recover it. There was a kind of pressure on the Georgian tourists to, to deliver the goods, to write it all up on a daily basis. Given that um, the pedestrians carried light knapsacks, it's unsurprising that Keats doesn't refer to any Scottish guidebooks or travel accounts, particularly as he was carrying three volumes of Carey's Dan translation of Dante, in his, uh, in his rucksack. In a letter of 7th August, Brown does mention my itinerary, which Nelson Bushnell conjecturally identified as the Traveler's Guide to Scotland uh, of 1814. Well, Carol Walker finds only inconsistent parallels here with Keats's letters. One other candidate does, in my view, deserve consideration, James Duncan's popular uh, single volume, uh, The Scotch Itinerary, containing the roads through Scotland on a new plan, uh, the second edition of 1808. Um, this pocket-sized volume is more portable than the two-volume Traveller's Guide, even if the latter in the updated edition of 1814 would have offered a more up-to-date account of Scottish roads than Duncan's. Not only does Duncan contain a useful road map, um, I've got a very a rather poor quality picture of that road map from the Glasgow University Library copy of the itinerary, but in addition to offering itineraries and graduated uh, distances between Scottish towns, it included a list of roadside inns and post offices, useful information for tourists like Keats, concerned with posting and receiving letters en route. The strongest evidence for Duncan um, as, the, as their guidebook lies in the um, circumstances in relation to which Brown mentions the guidebook. Uh, I quote from Brown, at the top of the Glen, that's Glen Crow on the military road to Inverary, 
My itinerary mentioned a place called Rest and Be Thankful, nine miles off. Now we'd set out without breakfast, intending to take our meal there, when horror and starvation, Rest and Be Thankful, was not an inn, but a stone seat. Um, and you can see here the, the stone erected by the soldiers uh, who put it up, who built it on the military road in 1768. In, that's uh, still there on, in Glen Crow. If Brown was using Duncan's Scotch itinerary, this error is easily accounted for. For as the relevant passage in itinerary 69, and it's all kind of listed, it's very schematic, um, uh, Glasgow to Inverary by Luss reads, one mile further, um, what is it? Um, one, far, one mile further, I'm got my, pressing my cursor on it, enter Glen Crow on Arthur's seat or the cobbler for about three mil, miles is awfully sublime. Two miles beyond Glen Crow is rest and be thankful on a, a good road to Loch Goyhead, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but that's all. By contrast, the um, other, the, dun the, um, the appendix to the traveler's guide, different pleasure tours through Scotland makes matters much clearer. The road gains the summit called rest to be thankful, 29, 29 miles from Dumbarton. Here a seat is formed in a stone place with the above inscription, which accords with the feeling of every traveler. Duncan's sketch information about rest to be thankful explains Brown's and Keats's error. Impossible if they've been following the fuller account and the traveler's guide. Okay, in this next section, I'm gonna say something about Keats and literary attachment. The first two stages of Keats's walking tour were dominated by powerful poetic associations. The Lake District with Wordsworth, Dumfries and Ayrshire with Robert Burns. Critics have, critics have explored the connections between his inspired prose descriptions of Ambleside, quote, refining one's sense of vision into a sort of North Star and Wordsworth's excursion. His disappointment at discovering his poetic hero's support for the Tory Lord Lothar against the Whig candidate, Henry Broom, in the Westmoreland election. What think you of that? Wordsworth versus Broom, sad, sad, sad. His encounter with Burns's tomb in Dumfries and the birthplace cottage at Alloway elicited a different kind of disappointment. Because the, the, the birthplace had been turned into a dram house for tourists. Burns talked with bitches, he drank with blackguards, he was miserable. What Keats denounced as the flummery of a birthplace seemed to give the lie to literary tourism and travel writing. One song of Burns's, is of more worth to you than all I could think of for a whole year in his native country. But after the aborted visit to Northern, visit to Northern Ireland, Keats was inspired by the view of Goatfell and the Black Mountains on the Isle of Arran, seen from the Ayrshire coast, asking himself, how is it that they did not beckon Burns to some grand attempt at epic? And I think this interestingly confirms the links uh, raised in my first, my opening quote, um, between his own mountain tour, his readings of Dante, and the plans for Hyperion. Aaron was uh, Keats's first view of the Highlands, ultimate destination of the walking tour, and its mountains seemed to hold out a greater promise. One remarkable feature of Keats's Highland tour writing when read in the context of other contemporary tours, uh, something I became very um, evident, uh, very obvious to me when I was researching the final chapters of my book, Stepping Westward, uh, which is really about the impact of Scott's poetry and, and novels on um, the development of tourism and landscape aesthetics um, in, the, in the period after 1815. But what's extraordinary about Keats's tour is the scarcity of his allusions to Walter Scott. Um, because Scott really had overtaken Ossian as the um, principle of literary attachment for tourists visiting the Highlands. True, Keats brief, briefly gestured to Scott mania in his letter to Tom on 9th July, writing that we are now in Meg Merrily's country and have this morning passed through some parts exactly suited to her, calling forth a ballad on the sibylline protagonist of Guy Mannering. Old Meg, she was a gypsy and lived upon the moors. But the inspiration was secondhand, for as Brown noted on the road to Ochenkern, I chatted half the way about Guy Mannering, for it happened that Keats had not then read that novel. Other than that, the only reference to Scott's poetry in Keats's letters from the Highlands is a piece of bawdy satire, which he attributed to Brown, and dispatched to Tom in a letter of 17th July from Cairn something, that's uh, Cairn Do on Loch Fyne. The Lady of the Lake went, and it's quite difficult to read this, <laughs> I'll take a deep breath. The Lady of the Lake went to rock herself to sleep on Arthur's seat, and the Lord of the Isles coming to press a piece, and seeing her ass sleep, 
remembered their last meeting at Coney Stonewater. So touching her with one hand on the Vallis Lucis, while the other underwent her white haven, Irby stifled her clack man on that he might her angle see and give her a Buchanan and said. Despite the presence of some English and Welsh place names, Arthur's seat, that's uh, Ben Arthur or the Cobbler near Cairndu, rather than the more celebrated site in Edinburgh, Vallis Lucis, uh, it's Glen Luce and Galloway, and Buchanan um, are Scottish, and the bawdy references to Scott's two celebrated Highland verse romances, The Lady of the Lake and The Lord of the Isles, stand out a mile. I wonder if Keats and Brown were here bundling together Walter Scott, whom they must have known was the Eminence Grise behind Blackwood's magazine, and his friend Wordsworth, the Tory partisan. As with Keats's Sir Nevis's poem, which I'll discuss below, sublime landscape of the kind which tourists drooled over in this passage assumes a bawdy, sexualized life of its own. An even more deliberate rebuff to Scott was to avoid the Trussocks, which the walkers bypassed as they skirted Loch Lomond before turning off to Inverary. This was a site that had been rendered one of the most popular tourist destinations in Europe by Scott's Lady of the Lake. Even the association of Wordsworth's superb poem, Stepping Westward with Loch, Loch Catrin, seemed to have been insufficient to dispel Scott's monopoly on the Trossachs in Keats, Keats's imagination. Indeed, his most ambitious Scottish tour poem, There is a joy in footing slowly across a silent plain, might fruitfully be read as a palinode to the tourist sublime of Wordsworth's earlier poem. Stepping westward ends with a celebration of, quote, traveling through the world that lay before me in my endless way. But for all his joy in travel, Keats expresses horror of losing his mind on mountains bleak and bare, grateful for the anchor of home, of brother's eyes, of sister's brow pulling him back. For at the cable's length, man feels the gentle anchor pull and gladdens in its strength. Now in the next and uh, final section of the talk, I'm going to um, be looking at Keats in the Highlands. Toiling up the steep military road in Glen Crow, which you can see here, uh, to rest and be thankful. This is the view from rest and be thankful, looking back down the, um, the military road. This is the one that's always blocked because of endless landslides, um, much to the fury of people who live in, in Inverary or uh, anywhere in Argyll. Um, Keats was pleased, he wrote, he was quite pleased with the noise of shepherds, sheep and dogs in the misty heights close above us, creeping among the crags like emmets, yet their voices came quite plainly to us. If he was aware of the social consequences of the draconian sheep clearance, which had depopulated huge areas of Argyll and the rest of the Highlands by 1818, he forbore to comment. Brown actually asked a pertinent question, quote, why should so beautiful a country be so poor? At the next stop in Vereri, Keats attended a performance of Kotzebue's melodrama, The Stranger in a Barn, accompanied by a bagpipe, which inspired a facetious sonnet and some condescending remarks about beastly bagpipes and wretched players. Gillian Russell proposes that Keats's fascination with these strolling players reflected, quote, the precarious mobility of his own position in 1818, raising questions as to where he properly belonged in relation to the theater of culture and the meaning of his own romantic vagrancy. Proceeding northward to Oban with the aim of visiting the islands of Iona and Staffa, the pedestrians deviated from the beaten track of the Petit Tour on July, uh, 19th July by walking 20 miles down the side of Loch Ore, had no supper but eggs and oat cake, and they really found it very hard to get food and, and really live mainly on eggs and oat cake and whiskey. I am for the first time in a country where a foreign language is spoken, wrote Keats. They gabble away in Gaelic at a vast rate. Numbers of them speak English. There are not many kilts in Argyllshire. Exciting as this was, it also proved irksome when lodging in the inn at Ford, some whiskey men sat up clattering Gaelic till I am sure one o'clock to our great annoyance. Like other travelers in the Highlands, Keats was shocked by the poverty. Some dozen wretched black cottages scented of peat smoke, which finds its way by the door or a hole in the roof, a girl here and there barefoot. Yet he also carefully observed that there is a Gallic testament on the drawers in the next room, and that white and blue chinaware has crept all about here. This shows Keats' eye for social detail, conscious that literacy, uh, the translation of the Gallic translation of the Bible, published in 1805, um, and um, uh, um, 
pot, uh, ceramic um, pottery, uh, Wedgwood, maybe or cheaper imitations of Wedgwood pottery. Um, so consumer culture, as well as tourism, were transforming the traditional society of the Gales. There was a wild place, wrote Brown of the Isle of Mull, which they traversed in order to reach Iona and Staffa. Quote, over bog and rock and river with our breeches tucked up and our stockings in our hand. Accompanied by an unnamed guide, they were accommodated in a shepherd's cottage on the night of the 22nd on the drove road from Craig Muir through Glenmore to Bonesson and, and uh, Finnefort. Sleeping in the shepherd's taidu, the black house, made a strong impression on Keats as he stooped to enter, quote, a little compartment with the rafters and turf blackened with smoke, shared with the family and their snoring guide. Unfortunately, despite the kindness of their hosts, they were unable to communicate directly as the family speak not a word but Gaelic, he wrote. The next day, however, Brown made genealogical inquiries about his grandfather from a local lady whose maiden name was Brown. Down is a common Gaelic surname, often anglicized as Down or Downey, or translated as Brown. While the family gathered around the cottage door, handled his spectacles as we do a sensitive leaf. This is a somewhat earlier view of a, of a, of a black house, uh, Highland Cottage from Pennant's tour. Uh, so it's about 40 years earlier. En route for uh, Bonesson on the 23rd of July, Keats and Brown breakfasted in a house which um, Keats described as, quote, by comparison, a mansion after the shepherd's hut, identifying it as Dan and Cullen at the head of a letter he wrote to Tom dated 23rd, 26th July. Carol Curris Walker located this house, now a fairly inaccessible ruin, looking over to Ben Moore in the middle of her plantation. And you can see it here um, as uh, Dorin and Cullen, meaning the grove of the fox clubs, fox cubs. Mull with its heath and rock and river and bog and their over overnight lodging in the shepherd's hut seemed like, quote, quote, what in England would be called a horrid place, even if Ke Keats felt more comfortable than I could have imagined. Through his guide and local people, however, he gained some experience of the island's rich heritage of Gaelic poetry and song. Dougal MacPhail, Mull's most famous 19th century Gaelic poet, was born in 1819 at his father's farm of Derry Cullen, Derry Cullen, today commemorated by memorial at Strathcoyle, through which Keats and Brown would have trudged en route to Iona. Unfortunately, I was very excited because I thought that Keats had had breakfast in the, uh, in the birthplace of Dougal MacPhail, uh, but it's a different Doria, uh, different Derry Nakulin, uh, although albeit one very, very near. The two, the different houses. This one translates, the name translates as the Grove of Holly. MacPhail's uh, pastoral evocation of the landscape of his childhood in his famous song, Anchel and Mulech, certainly makes a strong contrast with Keats's heath and rock and river and bog. Uh, I, won't, um, I won't read the tricky uh, 19th century Gaelic, but uh, uh, the translation, how smooth the meadow, how sweet and healthy with its soft blossoms of gentlest perfume, how pure the banks where I grew to manhood in Derry Hulan and below Ben Varniach. Keats and Brown's guide sang them two Gaelic songs as they trudged along the rough drove road to Derry Nakulin. Quote, one made by Mrs. Brown on her husband's being drowned, the other a Jacobin one on Charles Stewart. It's nice to see Keats here committing the undergraduate howler of confusing Jacobin and Jacobite. Charting a boat at uh, Finnefort, the um, tourists, the pedestrians rejoined the tourist trail when they landed on Iona or Akulmkil, as it was still, Akulmkil, as it was still commonly known, on the morning of July the 24th. Keats provides an uncharacteristically full description of the island's medieval antiquities in his letter to Tom of July the 26th. Who would expect to find the ruins of a fine cathedral church or cloisters, colleges, monasteries and nunneries in so remote an island? Perhaps seeking to avoid Walter Scott's romance version of Scottish medievalism, on Iona he experienced the real thing, as he would again on August the 7th, when he viewed some skulls in Bewley Abbey near Inverness that inspired him to verse. Nick Rowe notes um, how, quote, Keats's encounter with the medieval and Gothic in Scotland anticipates um, the Eva St. Agnes and La Belle Dame Sans Mercy um, composed the following year. That's what uh, Iona Abbey would have looked like when Keats saw it without the restored roof. 
On Iona, Keats endearingly muddled the number of kings buried in the cemetery, whereas Pennant's canonical account has 48 Scots monarchs, four Irish and eight Norwegians. Keats has 48 Scotch from Fergus II to Macbeth, eight Irish, four Norwegian and one French. Or more likely the confusion of numbers derived from the local guide and schoolmaster who showed them round. Quote, an ignorant little man called Maclean, he stops at one glass of whiskey unless you press another, and at the second, unless you press a third, and keeps his recollection. Keats's recollection of the basaltic island of Staffa and of the dimension of Fingal's cave in the same letter also scrambles the received version, which derives from um, Joseph Banks's celebrated account published in Thomas Pennant's 1772 tour in Scotland. And this is the original drawing made by Banks's artists in 1772 of uh, Fingal's cave. This became the, uh, this is in the British Library. It's a fantastic drawing which is featured in our exhibition. Um, and it's, uh, it, became, uh, it was printed and published in, in Pennant. You're probably more familiar with the printed version of it. Whilst claiming um, that it can only be represented by a first rate drawing, Keats rose to the occasion of, in his praise of Fingal's cave, considered the, which was then considered the high point of the Highland tour. For solemnity and grandeur, it far surpass, surpasses the finest cathedral this echoes Joseph Banks's, compared to this, what are the cathedrals or the palaces built by men? Again, Banks's version was probably the basis for the information purveyed by tourist guides. So I don't think that Keats had a copy of Pennant with him in that tiny rucksack, but <clears throat> he, um, it was so influential canonical that it was probably uh, purveyed to visitors by the tour guides. In 1772, Banks had famously established, established the Oceanic title of Stafford's Great Cave, Fingal's Cave or Uof Hien, which he attributed to local tradition. How fortunate, um, how fortunate um, is, uh, that, that in this cave we should meet with the remembrance of that chief whose existence, as well as that of the whole epic poem, is almost doubted in England. Stafford's popularity as the jewel in the crown of Highland tourism largely depended on the mania for Ossian. Even if the leg legitimacy of the cave's Gallic title had been questioned, Scott's recent allusion to Stafford's cave and Cantor Four of the Lord of the Isles had further promoted its fame. Although as an Ossian skeptic, Scott refused the denomination Fingal's Cave, preferring to call it the Palace of Neption, which is not without its resonance for, uh, for Keatsians and readers of Endymion. Carol Walker suggests that the story of Keats weaves for Tom, sorry, the story that Keats weaves for Tom about Jove and the giants is on a scale with Fingal's history, even if he shows little interest in Ossian compared to other contemporary tourists. Suppose now, this is Keats, suppose now the giants who rebelled against Jove had taken the whole mass of black columns and bound them together like a bundle of matches and then with immense axes had made a cavern in the body of those column, these columns. Such is Fingal's cave, except that the sea has done the work of excavations and is continually dashing there. Along the island, you might seat an army of men, each on a pillar. Despite these epical imaginings, Keats claimed to be, quote, puzzled how to give Tom an idea of Staffa. So he resorted to experimental verse in the poem, not Aladdin Magian ever such a work begun. Uh, albeit with uneven success. Uh, he wrote, I'm sorry, I'm so indolent as to write such stuff as this. But with echoes of Endymion book three, the poet meets Mil Milton's Lysidas asleep in Fingal's cave, who praises this cathedral of the sea before regretting the taint of modern tourism. Tis now free to stupid face, to cutters and to fashion boats, to cravats and petticoats. Keats concluded his letter to Tom on a moving note of homesickness. I long for a seat and a cup of tea at Well Walk, especially now that mountains, castles and lakes are becoming common to me. The um, final act um, in the tragic comic drama of Keats's Highland Tour was the ascent of Ben Nevis on the 2nd of August, an experience which, as Simon Bainbridge has recently proposed in Mountaineering and British Romanticism, endowed him with a new way of seeing. Setting off at 5 a.m. with a guide in the tartan and cap, Keats described uh, his ascent of Britain's highest mountain, 
as being almost like a fly crawling up a wainscot. As with his account of Stafford, his August the 3rd uh, letter to Tom is a strange mixture of cockney facetiousness. Imagine the task of mounting 10 St. Paul's without the convenience of staircases. And romantic nature description, as he evokes the deep rifts in the side of the mountain and the shifts in perspective caused by the fast moving cloud cover on the summit. Cloud veils opening with a dissolving motion and showing us the mountainous region beneath us through a loophole. These mouldy loopholes ever varying and discovering fresh prospects, east, west, north and south. This fine description reminiscent of Pennant's account of ascending Snowdon and similar accounts of mountain summits by Stoddart and Wordsworth is developed in the sonnet, read me a lesson muse and speak it loud upon the top of Nevis, blind is in mist. Uh, and this is the sonnet with which this poor witless elf concludes this final letter. Bainbridge finds in this sonnet's negative sublime, um, sorry, but Bainbridge finds in this sonnet a negative sublime in which the summit experience leads not to revelation and self-aggrandizement, but rather to a state of not knowing and self-diminution. This accords with the judgment of Keats's recent biographer, Nick Rowe, that, quote, on the summit of Old Ben, as Keats called the mountain, he had discovered what it meant to clamber through the clouds and exist, unaware as yet that he too was stepping on the road of the dead. And there's, I think, an extra pathos um, to this, given the, that we're just approaching the 200th anniversary of Keats's death um, in, in Rome. Yet even here, Keats's prose narrative suddenly shifts into bantering analogy. There is not a more fickle thing than the top of a mountain. What would a lady give to change her headdress as often and with as little trouble? This is the cue for one of Keats's most bizarre pieces of tour verse. The bawdy story of Mrs. Cameron, a figure from true life, apparently, a buxom 50 year old local lady whom Keats's letters informed his brother had ascended the mountain a few years early. And the personified mountain, Sir Nevis, aroused from his slumber of a thousand years by the lady's presence on his summit. The poem turns rather nasty as the whiskey soaked and sexually frustrated dame chides the ancient mountain for his impotence. Stone cold Sir Nevis summons his servants, Red Craig, Red Craig and Blockhead, to heat him up, figured by the chumescence of some young earth dragons who swell to twice 10 times the size of Northern Whale to enable Nevis to quote, press my dainty morsel to my breast. What, madam, can you then repent of all the toil and vigor you have spent to see Ben Nevis and to touch his nose? Dear madam, I must kiss you, faith I must. I must embrace you my dear, with, my dearest, with my dearest gust. When the lady faints, uh, he pulled the clouds again about his head and went to sleep again, leaving her to make the vile descent from the summit. In line with Keats's other swipes at tourist aesthetics, this act of coitus interruptus appears to be a bawdy satire on the female sublime, reduced here to sexual appetite, as well as satirizing the contemporary fashion, female mountaineering, as Bainbridge um, argues. Possibly Sarah Murray is again a target here, especially her account of a phallic Ben Nevis in The Companion and Useful Guide, as she, quote, anxiously watched the humor of the sovereign and with a joy perceived in his majesty, a strong inclination to uncover. So unlike Keats's Mrs. Cameron, um, Murray didn't attempt the climb, but at the time of her travel, she was also a touring widow in her late fifties with a Highland surname. In this respect, Robert Jarvis rightly questions, I quote, whether the experience of climbing Ben Nevis fulfilled Keats's intention to load me with grander mountains and strengthen more my reach in poetry. Indeed, it's the satirical overtones of load me with mountains that are amplified and overrule the normal discipline of travel writing. I think that's absolutely spot on. Um, I think uh, Robin's uh, reading is tremendously insightful. Earlier in his tour, Keats had queried the whole project of travel writing, suggesting in a letter to Reynolds that, although less than a present palpable reality, fancy is greater than remembrance. In this view, poetry is de-territorialized as the insights of imagination transcend locality. We saw his quote, one song of Burns is of more worth to you than all I could think of for a whole year in his native country. Nevertheless, as Fiona Stafford suggests, 
the experience of hard travel in unfamiliar places had enriched his imagination and crucially demonstrated to him the way in which poetry could act as both a ship and an anchor to those responsive to its special strengths. In this respect, Keats's performance and narration of the Highland Tour offers an insight into the complexity of his poetics, as well as illuminating and ironizing the material and aesthetic prerogatives of the Scottish tour in the late Georgian period, whatever its meaning. His odd satire on Highland tourism and fashionable landscape aesthetics throughout, but particularly in the, the final poem we've discussed, Sir Nevis, was an appropriate precursor to Keats's Cockney pronouncement in the letter to Miss, Mrs. Wiley four days later from Inverness, that I have been very romantic indeed among these mountains and lakes. Thank you. So that's the end of my talk. I just, before I, um, I stop sharing screen, I just want to say a word about, um, I've already mentioned Carol Kairos Walker's wonderful um, seminal book, um, Walking North with Keats. And it was a pleasure to meet Carol at Nick Rowe's conference in St Andrews a couple of years ago. And I'm delighted to say that um, a new edition, a revised edition of this book with her fantastic photographs, um, many of them in colour in this edition, is being uh, published by Edinburgh University Press later uh, this year. So do, I would recommend it most strongly. It's a tremendous book um, and you know, has, it contains the text of the letters and the, all the associated um, written material about the tour by Keats and Brown, but also with her own interpretive essay and with her amazing photographs. Um, I also mentioned I'm doing a bit of self-publicity here. Uh, there was a short, this, this paper is expanded from a short section in the final chapter of my book, Stepping Westward, Writing the Highland Tour. So if you're interested in finding out more about the broader context of Keats's tour, um, I uh, hope this will be a useful resource for you. Um, finally, um, I just want to plug this book that's just been published, uh, Old Ways, New Roads, um, uh, Travels in Scotland, 1720 to 1832, which I've co-edited with John Bonehill, who's an art historian, and Anne Dulau, who's um, uh, one of the curators the, in, in the Hunterian Art Gallery in Glasgow. And it's been a great a joy working with John and Anne on this book and this project. It was meant to be a book to accompany an exhibition, a Hunterian exhibition, um, on entitled Old Ways and New Roads. And we'd spent three years assembling a wonderful range of paintings and maps and other documents, uh, basically showcasing the visual culture of the tour. Sadly, the uh, exhibition has fallen prey, a victim to COVID, like so many other things. Um, uh, but the, the, there will be an online exhibition, which has just been launched. So do check the Hunterian website and there'll be a series of events um, uh, recorded events and live events too, associated with uh, Always New Roads. But the book itself is published by, by, by Berlin Press in Edinburgh, and um, it's got, uh, it's really a, a book of essays by leading experts, and it contains chapters on the maps and paintings of the tour, on antiquities, natural history, topography and estate planning, on panoramas and theatre painting, and a wonderful essay by Vicky, Vicky Coltman on the material culture, the knickknacks on the tour, um, as well as an essay, a comparative essay on the Welsh and Irish tour in relation to the uh, Scottish tour. And it's got, this book um, is, comes at an extraordinarily knockdown price of 20 pounds um, from Berlin or from the Hunterian. So do get yourself a copy. Um, um, uh, when, so with that shameless act of, um, of plugging, I'm gonna um, come out now, end the show and stop sharing. <laughs>